2 Timothy and chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Appreciate so much your prayers uh, for our, the movement of our property across the uh, water on uh, Thursday. That all went very well. And uh, there was no problems at the other end. And all our property now is being held in storage, ready for us to arrive and uh, find a house and uh, then do it all over again, unpacking the other way. But uh, we're grateful for your prayers for those who came to help and uh, glad that the Lord worked it out for us to do that with uh, the minimum of fuss. 2 Timothy chapter 4 today and verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, Make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Shall we pray? Our gracious God and heavenly Father, how we indeed love the thought of your appearing. And Lord, we are so glad today that as we gather in the name of our beloved Savior, that we meet not around the memory of a dead man, but of the one who is alive forevermore. And so, Lord, we ask today that you would meet with us, that your Holy Spirit would make his presence felt in our midst, that we would know his touch upon our hearts as we study the word of God together, as its truths are proclaimed. May, O oh Lord, you enlighten our minds. May you energize our spirits. May you cause us to be edified, to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless, I pray, both the preacher and those who are hearing, and use this time for the honor and the glory of our Savior, in whose dear name we pray. Amen. Well, we've been thinking these past few weeks about Paul's final words, and I, I hope we've had some uh, thoughts that have been brought to your mind that were helpful along the way, but on this, which is of course my final Sunday, as Hazel and I prepare to move on, there can probably be no more fitting text than the one I've just read to you this morning. Here is Paul's final charge to Timothy. He's at the end of the most amazing journey. He, of course, encountered the Savior on the Damascus Road many years before and was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And he launched out into the unknown among people who were foreign to him in both their practice and their custom as well as their religious outlook. And he brought the glorious good news of Jesus Christ to them. And of course, he and the other apostles turned the world as it was then upside down and they changed history forever in fact the lord jesus changed history forever they were simply the messengers it was christ who was changing the world as it was at that time and now paul says he's anticipating his departure in verse 6 he says the time of my departure is at hand now of course he's not speaking about a house move in the traditional sense but he's talking about an altogether different house move. He's now thinking about moving from earth to heaven because he's anticipating that he's going to die and he's going to be executed and he's preparing to be put to death 
by the decree of the emperor Nero. And so he says, for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. Now, to this point in the epistle, he has addressed the issue of witness. He has told Timothy he ought not to be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ or of him as the prisoner of the Lord. He has instructed him about being a good soldier and enduring hardness, uh, encouraging Timothy to continue on through the difficulties and the trials and the troubles that would lie before him. He reminded Timothy of the indestructible nature of the word of God, how that although he was bound, the word of God was not bound. And it could never be contained, even by the Roman Empire itself. And then he focused, as we saw last Sunday, on matters pertaining to the end times. And he warns Timothy that perilous times lay ahead uh, for the church of God. And, and so even here in chapter 4, he touches on that theme again somewhat when he says in verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And I think we're seeing that characteristic of the end times today also, where Christians are ceasing to be disciples and evolving into consumers. And they're more interested in their being pleased than in God being pleased. And that's a real danger in this present hour. So Paul speaks of these things. And now as he pens his last words, he wants to ensure that Timothy... This underling, if you like, this, uh, this uh, disciple of his, this uh, protege, whatever term you might care to use of him, that Timothy is going to continue and finish his course. Look at verse 7. Paul says himself, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course, my course. I have kept uh, the faith. You know, it's, it's, a, it's true to say that a, a great start is good. But a great finish is better. You see, anybody can start anything. Anybody can start anything. And I can tell you over the years in my pastoral ministries that people many times have said, Pastor, let's do this. And they want to start something. And then after a week or two or a month or two, they'll come back and they'll say, I don't want to do that anymore. Well, we don't want that, do we? If you start something, you should commit to finish it. And that's what Paul is telling uh, Timothy. He's reminding him as a pastor, it's important that you not only begin in terms of your ministry at Ephesus, but like me, you finish your course. You know, let me just stop for a moment and remind you of a man by the name of Braun Clifford. Now, you may never have heard of Braun Clifford. You might say, well, who is Braun Clifford? But if you had been around at the end of World War II, you would certainly have known the name Braun Clifford in Christian circles. You see, many believe that this young man was the most gifted and the most powerful preacher that the church had seen and witnessed in generations. He was just 25 years of age, and he was filling stadiums full of people who would come out to hear him. They would queue in lines 10 people wide just to get in the doors and to hear this young man preach. And they would hang on his every word. And so he, at, the, at that tender age, at 25, this young man had touched more lives and he had influenced more leaders and he had set more attendance records for church meetings than any other preacher in modern church history. So you said to yourself, well, how come I've never heard of him? How come I've never heard one of his sermons or read one of his books? How come, Pastor, in all these years you've never quoted him? You've never said, well, Braun Clifford once said. Well, there's a very good reason for that. Because by the time he was 34, Clifford had lost his family. He had lost his uh, ministry. He had lost his health. And then finally he lost his life, gripped by alcoholism. He left his wife, he left their two Down syndrome children, and he died at the age of 35, suffering from cirrhosis 
of the liver. Some pastors at the time took pity upon his poor family, and they took up an offering among themselves in order to buy a coffin for his funeral, and he was buried in a cemetery for the poor. You see, he started well, but he finished badly. And that is so easy to do. It's great to start great, but it's greater to finish better. To finish great is better. And so here Paul is at the finishing line of his life. And I want you to see that there are three qualities, and we'll not be long this morning. There are three qualities that arose to the fore of his mind as he reflected upon his life, as he sought to exhort Timothy. And here are his final words in his final days before he goes on to be with the Lord. And notice there he says in verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He speaks about the Lord's reward. And he says, there is a reward and it's waiting. There's a reward for me and it's waiting. He says, not just for me, but it's also for all them that love his appearing. Here he says, there is something that is reserved for me, a crown of righteousness, but it's also reserved for you and for those who are faithful in anticipating the coming of the Lord. He says, God has it in store. Now, if you're anything like me, you've probably pondered when pastors and preachers, or even when you're reading the scriptures and you hear about these crowns and you read about the crowns that are on offer to those who are servants of the Lord in the end, if you're anything like me, you've probably wondered if you'd even get a crown. You know, you just think of other people who you hold in far higher esteem to yourself and who you think would be far more deserving of a crown than we are. And you and I may think to ourselves, well, I'm going to st stand before the Lord and uh, I'm going to have nothing. He's not going to have any crown to afford me. And honestly, if that were the case, we would have nothing to complain about because we're saved entirely by his grace. The Lord owes us nothing. He doesn't owe us a single thing. We owe him. We're debtors to him. He is not a debtor to us. And so Paul tells us here, though, that if that's your concern, if, if at the back of your mind you're thinking, well, I'm going to get before the Savior and I'm going to be ashamed or embarrassed because I'm not going to qualify for any kind of reward or crown from his hand. Uh, Paul says, now listen, I want you to understand that this thing is reserved for you. It's been put away for you. It's been put aside for you. It has your name on it. You know, we're in a position now, if you want to visit a restaurant, you have to phone ahead, don't you? And you have to make a booking usually now, whereas before you could just walk in and expect to get a seat. Now, because the restaurants have limited seating, they have to take bookings, and they're wanting to be careful, obviously, about uh, the pandemic and about the spread of disease and so on. But you get along to that restaurant now, and you come to the front desk, and the, the first question you're asked is, have you made a booking? And if you say yes, then they ask you your name. And you give them your name, and they check their computer, and sure enough, there's your name, and then the waitress will lead you to a seat that is reserved just for you. It's the same thing when you go to a hotel. If you've ever been in a hotel, as I'm sure many of you have, you book in advance, obviously, and you go up to the reception, and there they, they say, hello, how can we help you? And you say, I've booked a room for the night. What is your name? You give them your name. They look at the computer. They see your name. They get the form out. You sign the form. They give you the key card. And they'll say, your room is number 232 or whatever it is. And tell you how to get there. And you get there. And what are you expecting when you get there? You don't expect the, the blankets to be on the floor, the duvet to be on the floor, and for grease to be coming down the walls of the shower. You expect everything to be prepared, don't you? You expect the bed to be cleaned. You expect the, the, uh, the bathroom facilities to be spotless. Uh, you expect the little soaps to be out. In other words, you're saying, I anticipate because I've made a reservation that they're going to be ready for me when I get there. Some of you will remember many years ago, about 14, 15 years ago, Hazel and I, on our 25th 
wedding anniversary, uh, took a, a cruise, you remember, to China. We went out to, the, to uh, Hong Kong and China and Vietnam. We had a wonderful time together. And when I was booking that holiday, um, the chap on the other end of the phone said, well, would you like to pre-book a taxi from the airport? And I said, well, how much is it? Because, you know, I got a taxi from the train station here to my house, and it was a small mortgage. And uh, I said, well, how, how much is it? And he said, well, it'll be 17 pounds. And he says, they'll take you from the airport to your hotel. And we were staying in a hotel for two or three nights. And then they'll take you from the hotel to the cruise ship. And then when the cruise ship comes back, they'll meet you from the cruise ship, take you back to your hotel. And then when you're ready to go to the airport, they'll take you from the hotel to the airport. I thought, well, for 17 pounds, that's a bargain. 17 pounds, it gets you out of Stoke Station, across the road into the traffic lights. And I said, surely, give me, give me that. I'll sign up for that. Here's 17 pounds. Give me that taxi. So I says, here's what we got to the airport. Don't worry about a thing. We've got a taxi. Well, I was looking for a taxi rank. You know, as you do, I'm looking, where is this taxi company? And uh, everybody's around. They've got on their buses and their taxis, and they've gone. And I'm trying to figure out where am I going here. And I look, and just over to my left, there's a man standing dressed as a chauffeur. Cap, the whole uniform, everything. And he's holding my name. And I, and I walk over there and Hazel says to me, what have you done? And I said, I just booked a taxi. And uh, he took us out to a limousine. A limousine, no less. Lifted our bags into the boot, you know, opened the doors. We got in. There we were, like, you know, David and Victoria Beckham. And we were being whisked off to our hotel. And we went, to, when we came back from the cruise, it was ever so funny we came back from the cruise. You know, we came back into port in Hong Kong. And we got off the cruise ship. And there was our faithful chauffeur standing there, waiting for us with a big beaming smile, lifting our bags. Everybody else was queuing up for a bus. They were looking at us like we were celebrities. It was lovely. You know, we, we felt like we should wave at them as we were going by or they should at least try to get an autograph or something but that was reserved for us nobody else could get in that car it was ours for that for that particular time and period and there are things in heaven that, and, and things in eternity that are reserved now look in one peter for a moment i want you to see this because you've got to understand that just as there are reservations in life there are reservations in the afterlife. There's reservations in eternity. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, uh, Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively or a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved, look at these words, reserved in heaven heaven for you. Isn't that lovely? It's got your name on it. You're a Christian? God's marked it down on his list of reservations. It's incorruptible. It's an inheritance, undefiled. It fades not away. Never grow old. It'll never grow tattered. It'll never be tainted. It'll always be fresh and new every hour of eternity. That's the, that's the believer's reservation. But then, sadly, there's a reservation for unbelievers. If you look in 2 Peter in chapter 3, just across the page in, in verse 7, he talks about the world that was destroyed in verse 6 during the time of Noah. And then in verse 7, he says, But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition or the ruination of ungodly men. You see, there's a reservation here that is anything but good news. There's a reservation here that is damning. There's a reservation here of judgment. There's a, your name here is on the wrong side of the sheet 
as it were. And how important it is that you get those eternal reservations right. Because you know the disappointment if you go to a restaurant and they say, have you booked? And you say, no, I haven't. And they said, sorry, you can't come in. My friends, you leave with some measure of disappointment. But what woe will be to your soul when you stand before the Lord of glory and he says, have you a reservation in heaven? And you say, no, I have never been saved. I was never born again. And the Lord will say, well, there's another reservation for you. A reservation of judgment. The ruination of those who are deemed to be ungodly and rebellious. Make sure that you don't have to, uh, have to meet that reservation when the time comes. What kind of destiny is reserved for you? Well, Paul here speaks of a reward to those who are saved that is reserved uh, for us. And uh, he talks about what the Lord has done for us. There's a prize in heaven that has your name on it. And the Lord is holding it for you. He's expecting you someday to come and to pick it up. Uh, it is laid up for you. That's what the idea of that word uh, means there. Henceforth there is laid up for me a, a, a crown of righteousness. The, the, the idea means it's deposited. It's reserved. It's put by in store. It's out of reach of all others. You know, we were children... You know, people didn't have as much money when I was growing up. I'm not saying we were poor by any stretch of the imagination. We weren't poor. But there just wasn't quite as much money to go around as there is now. And our parents, and this was very common, at Christmas time, our parents would, uh, during the year, they would join a Christmas club. Some of you may remember that. And uh, maybe about this time of the year, Christmas clubs would open. And you would go into the local store and you would put a couple of pounds down on a card and the shopkeeper effectively would <laughs> save it up for you. And then come Christmas, you would, you, know, you would have pointed out the gifts that you're wanting to have your children to have and you would go in with your card and those gifts would be laid up for you. In other words, they weren't on show for everybody to have. Once you had that Christmas club card, those things were set aside for you and you knew that when Christmas came, you could take care of your family's needs and make sure it was a joyous occasion. Well, look, friends, the Lord Jesus has put aside a crown for you and it's waiting. It has your name on it. Notice what Paul says there in verse 8. He says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, notice he says, shall give me at that day. Not only is it waiting, but God is willing. I want you to get that. Bear in mind that God has laid aside this praise. It has your name on it. It is reserved for you. Paul says it's been reserved for me. This is a personal pronoun. He doesn't just say it's been reserved generally. He doesn't say, you know what, there's a prize over there. He says, no, it's a prize for me. It's for me. And, and now as if to reemphasize the possibility of securing that prize, uh, Paul points out that the Lord, the righteous judge there in verse 8, shall give me at that day. He shall give it to me at that day. Now, Paul was, remember, he's writing this epistle from prison. He's awaiting trial. Uh, he's been awaiting trial for some time, for several years. And he's, he knows that the emperor Nero is in control. Now, Nero, we know from history, was despotic. The man was deranged. Uh, and we know that the trial of Paul would have been what we might describe today as a show trial. It would have been politically charged so that uh, Nero could make a point about Christianity and Christian leaders. And he could really... That emphasize to the church as a whole, this is what happens to you if you follow this Jesus person. And Paul knew that he was unlikely to get a fair trial. He was unlikely to get a fair hearing this side of heaven. I mean, remember, if you go back into the book of Acts, uh, he stood before uh, various Roman authorities and they testified that he was innocent and yet they held him in prison. Why? Because they hoped that he would try and bribe his way out of prison. You see, the Roman legal system was often corrupt. And Paul says, in comparison to that corrupt system, which we're so familiar with, I'm going to stand before the Lord. And notice how he calls him the righteous judge. He's not an unfair judge. He's not a judge who lacks integrity. You know, he says the Lord is a righteous judge. 
and that there is the very real possibility of reward. There is a crown for us that, that God recognizes our labor and our effort and our sacrifice and our service. All of us, not just those who, not just those who uh, occupy the pulpit, but those who are faithful in occupying the pew and, and who are faithful in their service of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to understand something. You know, people have said some very nice things in the past few days and weeks. You know, somebody says to me, I've heard this regularly, you know, you're, gonna, you're a big pair of shoes to fill. And I say, that's what they said about Coco the Clown. Uh, but, but, you know, don't, I don't get above my station because here's the thing. Anything that was accomplished in my time here as ministry wasn't just because of me. It was because all of us served the Lord together. And God blessed. And he gets the glory. And in that respect, you shouldn't think to yourself that the guy who's in the pulpit is going to be set apart and he's going to get some kind of special treatment that somehow or other when I get to heaven, there's going to be that uniform chauffeur again and I'm going to go through the gates while you all come on the coach. No, 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 no. That's not the way this thing works. We're all on, all on the same ground at the foot of the cross. Nobody rises above another. And so the reward is given in righteousness. God's word is true. And we can trust him when it says that there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Look in Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10. Here's the flip side of that thought that Paul shares there in 2 Timothy 4.8. He says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. He, you know, the writer here, and, and I think in, in all honesty, I, I personally think it's Paul, but that's an aside. You know, he, he's, he's making the point that, you know, even if men do not appraise your effort, even if you're overlooked by the oversight or you're overlooked by the pastor and, and gratitude maybe isn't always expressed where it's deserved, God doesn't overlook it. God keeps the accounts. God keeps the record. And God sets aside the reward. Look with me in, in Genesis chapter 8 for a moment, because I want you to see this. God remembers you. God remembers you. And everything that you do in Genesis chapter 8, we encounter uh, Noah. And uh, chapter 8 of, of, uh, of, of Genesis in verse 1. And here's the man who was faithful 120 years preaching. 120 years preparing the ark, nobody listening to him, nobody responding to his message. And what do you get in verse 1 of chapter 8? Notice those first four words, and God remembered Noah. God didn't forget Noah. Other people were forgetting Noah, but God didn't forget Noah. God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark and God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. The waters went down. Look in Genesis chapter 19 for a moment. Genesis chapter 19. Verse 29. Genesis chapter 19 and verse 29. We've got a mobile phone emergency going on back there. Genesis 19 and verse 29. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain. These are the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God, that God what? Remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which, the, in which Lot dwelt. You remember how Abraham prayed and asked God for mercy for the righteous in Sodom? And the Bible says God remembered it. God doesn't forget. God doesn't overlook anything. Look at Numbers chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10, verse 9.
Numbers chapter 10 and verse 9, it says, And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and watch, and you shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. What a wonderful promise to young soldiers going into battle that the Lord was remembering them. Isaiah chapter 49, you'll remember this from our midweek studies, how the people of Judah, as they were going into Babylon, felt forsaken of the Lord. And their cry in verse 14 of Isaiah chapter 49 was, But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. And then comes this, uh, this question, Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? It's a rhetorical question. It's, a, it's unlikely that a woman forgets the child that she births. Even when women abandon their babies, even when they put them in little cots and leave them outside police stations or fire stations or hospitals, those women remember those babies till their dying day. God says, can a woman forget her baby? Not a chance. He says, they may forget. He says, even to learn for that possibility that there may be some human failure, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. And you've got to remember that uh, verse 16 in particular, that when the Lord Jesus looks at the scars on his hands where the nails were driven through, he remembers you and he remembers me. He doesn't forget us. He never turns his back upon us. Look in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, the very last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3, just one more verse along this same little chain and theme. Malachi 3 and verse 16 says, Then they that feared the Lord speak often one to another. That is, they, they talked about the Lord, as we talk about the Lord sometimes, don't we? We like nothing better sometimes than to sit down and have a good chin wag about the Lord. Then they that feared the Lord speak often one to another, and the Lord hearkened. He paid attention. There's always that silent witness to every conversation. And he heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. You see, there's a reward set aside for us. There is a reward that is waiting, and it's a reward which God is willing to give. And then as we go back to 2 Timothy 4 and 8, uh, Paul continues, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. The prize is waiting. God is willing. And we ought to be watching. Watching. Watching for the appearing of the Lord. Because when the Lord Jesus comes, he brings his reward with him. That's what Revelation 22 teaches us. This is the victor's crown that is being spoken of here. The word crown is the Greek word Stephanos, from which you get the, the name Stephen. And it was the term that was described, that described the laurel wreath that was placed upon the heads of victors uh, during the ancient Olympic Games. Of course, the Olympic Games are going to begin this week in Japan, and there'll be those who'll get up on the podium and they'll be given a gold medal. Well, it's the same idea that you're going to get a victor's crown if if you'll just stay faithful. Now notice our text begins with that word henceforth. Henceforth there is laid up for me. That means from this time forward. From what time? Well, you'll notice in verses 6 and 7, uh, Paul's testimony. He said, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He says, I'm ready to be offered. He's referring to his death, and he sees himself as a drink offering, as that which was going to be poured out into the ground before the Lord, so that it was irretrievable. He says, I'm at a point of no return. 
turn now. I cannot go back. I am ready to be offered. I am ready to go to heaven. This is the testimony of a man at the end of his days who spent his life serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you get any indication that he regretted it? Do you get any idea that he was having second thoughts? That he was looking back over his life and saying, you know what? I wish that encounter on Damascus Road had never happened. I would have missed all those beatings and starvings and all the things that I endured. No, he doesn't, say, he doesn't have any, any qualms whatsoever. He says, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. This was a man who told the Corinthians, and remember, the, the Corinthians uh, at, uh, were at some point questioning his authority as an apostle. He told, them, he told them that he would have, that he had spent, that he would spent and, and be spent for them. That he would give everything for them. And that's what he did. And that's where he was when he comes to this point in his life. He's finished. He's ready to depart. He's ready to go. And he has no regrets. How come? Because first of all, he's been a fighter. He's been a fighter. You know, the Christian life is a fight from the beginning to the end. You know, if you thought to yourself, well, it was going to be, you know, a nice, pleasant ride, you got on the wrong bus. It's a fight from start to finish. That's why Timothy was told to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He was told that he had to stay the course. Never expect the devil to let up. Never expect the devil to quit. Never expect the devil just to say, well, she's had enough now. He's had enough now. No, the devil's going to fight you every inch of the way. Paul knew that. Because he was a fighter, he was finished and ready to, ready to depart and prepared for reward. And then not only was he a fighter, he was a finisher. He says, I have finished my course. You know, the man who doesn't finish the race can't win the prize, can he? There are no prizes for dropouts. You know, in this day and age, we're taught that it's not the winning, it's the taking part that counts. But I think that you'll find during the Olympic Games that is not the way this works. I think you'll find that when those men or women stand on the podiums of gold, silver, and bronze, if somebody else comes up and says, but I came fifth, I took part, can I have something? <laughs> They'll say, no, you can't. You weren't good enough. Especially so if that person had ducked out of the race. If they'd quit, there's no rewards for dropouts. You know, I was a teenager. I used to run cross-country for our school. It's hard to believe, looking at the shape of me now, I know. But, but I used to run cross-country for our school. And we were doing this race. We were running this race a particular day. And uh, it was an unfamiliar course to me. And I was running around, and I was trying to remember where we were told to go. It was around a country park. And I went down a laneway to my right. Uh, and I was running, you know, as, as well as I could. And, and I came to the end of this laneway, and there was a lake in front of me and nowhere to go. It was a dead end. There was a great big lake in front of me. And I thought, this is definitely not the, <laughs> this is not the way I should have gone. <laughs> and so I stopped for a moment, and I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm lost. And then I could hear just beyond the trees the other runners running by. So I thought, well, I better wind my way back. Obviously, I, I should have stayed on that path and not gone down to the right. So I went back to the, the original path and continued running the race. And then I came to the finishing line, and our PE teacher was excited as anything. He was jumping up and down, totally animated. He was going, well done, Moore. You've won. You've won. And I thought, brilliant. I've won. How did I even do this? I've won. And the coach from the opposite school said, wait a minute, he hasn't run around twice. <laughs> and he looked at me, our teacher looked at me and says, is this only your first time? And I said, yes, sir, I got lost. And he chased me on around the corners. Well, friends, there's, there's no prizes for dropouts. You've got to finish the course. And not only was he a fighter and a finisher, he was faithful. Notice he says, I've kept the faith. Not simply kept faith, 
not even kept faithful, but have kept the faith. He's referring to the truth of the gospel. Uh, he's talking about uh, the, the truth of Christ as it was entrusted to him, the entire system and body of sound doctrine, the body of truth to which he had remained faithful. And now he was passing those truths along to others, in particular here to Timothy as a faithful young leader coming up in the next generation. Here was a man who had encountered false prophets and deceptive followers and bitter enemies, uh, but he guarded the gospel with his life, with a god given jealousy to keep it free from perversion or free from uh, any kind of adulteration. You know, and, and again in 2 Corinthians, he highlights some of the sufferings that he experienced as he, as he spoke to those people, he says, of those that they were holding above him. He says, are they ministers of Christ? Those people that are saying that I'm no apostle, are they ministers of Christ? He says, I speak as a fool, I am more. And then he goes on and says, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, see of one. Thrice, three times I beaten with rods or sticks. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches. You see, he was faithful no matter what happened. I wonder will we be able to say that in the end, all of us. You know, we have people today who care very little for the fight. They enjoy festivals, but they're not so happy about fights. They're careless about the things of God, careless about Bible doctrine, careless about the truth of the gospel, careless about holy living. Friend, when I get the, to the end, I don't want to be guilty of compromise. I want to be fulfilled in, in all that I was called to do and be able to say, as Paul said, I have kept the faith. And I hope that you feel that way too for yourself. And then not only was he a fighter and not only was he a finisher and not only was he faithful, but he was farsighted. He says that this praise is laid up not for me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. You see, he always lived his life with eternity in view and with the idea that the Lord could come today. That's the way to live it. He walked in the light of the imminency of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he knew, as I said earlier, that when the Lord comes, he brings his reward with him. Writing to the Thessalonians, he says, for what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? He says, that's what I'm looking for. When I was a boy, I was in the boys' brigade. Uh, as a young boy, I loved it. I loved the boys' brigade. If you're not familiar with the boys' brigade, it's a church organization. Uh, and uh, it you know, takes in primary school and secondary school children, boys and girls, obviously, in the girls' brigade. But I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the games. I enjoyed the competitions, I enjoyed the sports, I enjoyed the display nights when your parents or friends or family would come and watch you do gymnastics and marching and did little sketches and so on. I loved the challenges that were set before us to win badges. I just loved the boys' brigade. And, uh, you know, the biggest prize of all in the boys' brigade when I was a lad was a trophy called the Proficiency Cup. Now, I didn't even know what the word proficiency meant back then, but I did know about this cup because although that was a big word, uh, you know, this, this cup sat on our sideboard for a whole year because my brother had won it four years before me. And I remember passing it almost daily, you know, looking at that cup and admiring it. You know, it was a good sized cup. And every now and then I'd hold it up like it was the FA Cup, you know, like you, like you were winning the FA Cup. And I, and I, and I thought, I want to win this cup. I want to win this cup. 
cup. I admired it. And so I went all out for it. I, I determined to win it. I attended every single meeting of the Boys Brigade. I went to the Bible classes. I had my uniform pristine. You know, I made sure my shoes were shined and my buckle was, uh, was uh, cleaned on my belt and my hat sat straight and, and my badges were right on my arm and all those things. You know, I just was, I, I was the absolute you know, epitome of what a Boys Brigade boy uh, should be. Saturday mornings, rain or shine, I got up and went out and played football for the Boys Brigade team. It didn't matter if it was frosty, snowy, rainy, windy. I was out there playing football for the Boys Brigade uh, team. And I loved it. And finally the night came around when that trophy was to be won. And the guest of honor came to the platform and I sat out there and I waited for him. And he announced the winner of the Proficiency Cup 1972 is Philip Ormsby. And I thought, Philip Ormsby? Philip Ormsby? Philip Ormsby didn't even play for the football team. Philip Ormsby, Ormsby didn't even take part in gymnastics. Philip Ormsby was a big, heavy set boy who could hardly run the length of himself. He was a nice boy, but certainly he wasn't nice enough to win the proficiency cup. <laughs> I'm not bitter about it or anything, but I remember his name to this day. <laughs> Honestly, I was gobsmacked. I couldn't believe it. I genuinely couldn't believe that Philip Ormsby, who didn't participate in the organization as often as I did, or as with as much zeal as I had, had won this prize. And I was absolutely devastated. And uh, one of the leaders, seeing my disappointment, took me aside to console me. And, he, and I'll never forget his words. He said, you know, you really would have won that cup, but we gave it to Philip Ormsby because your brother had already won it four years before. And that was the reason that I was the runner-up. And you know, that brought me no comfort at all because <laughs> you know and I know that that wasn't a good reason not to give the praise to the person who deserved the praise. It didn't make me feel better one little bit. By the way, that kind of stuff goes on in churches all the time with pastor's kids. Sometimes people in Sunday school say, we can't give it to this child because he's the pastor's kid. Don't let that happen. The child deserves a praise. He deserves a praise, whether he's the pastor's kid or he's, you know, a plumber's kid. It makes no difference. He deserves the praise. But here's the thing. Regardless of the fact that I didn't get my hands on that trophy for myself, Paul says, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He talks about like he's already won it. He hasn't stood before the Lord yet. He hasn't been judged yet. He hasn't stood at the judgment seat of Christ. And yet he speaks about it as being already there. He's already had it. And then he adds, not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. You see, God is righteous. Your brother Paul has won it. And he says, you can win it also, because God will not discriminate, and he will always reward our faithfulness, our service, and our sacrifice, because he's a righteous God. Friends, We've got a wonderful future ahead, whether here at Milton or wherever I am in Points Pass or wherever you may be in the future. The Lord is with us. His praise is held out for us. And all we've got to do is stay faithful till Jesus comes or heaven beckons. May God bless these thoughts to your hearts this morning.